go! It's the L.A. Football Podcast. Touchdown Ram! Recovered by the Chargers. Touchdown UCLA! With USC great and NFL stud, Frosty Rucker. The Trojans back in front. And LAFB founder, Ryan Zyrood. On the Believe Podcast Network and LAFBnetwork.com. This is your destination for Los Angeles football. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be listening. This is the LA Football Podcast on the Believe Podcast Network and LAFBnetwork.com. I am your co-host, Ryan Dyer, joined, as always, by my man, Frosty Rucker. What's going on, man? Man, what up, LA? We're in here. We're in the house. We got a show for you today. That is right. Got a fantastic show. Uh, We'll get into the interview quick. We're joined by Doc Holliday and Hall of Famer Isaac Bruce. Had a blast chat with those guys. But before we get into that great interview, real quick, breaking news. Joey Bosa signing a long-term deal with the Chargers. Frosty, what was your initial thoughts when you saw the news? Money, 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 money. No, man. Well-deserving. You know, when you're hearing all this chatter that one day he might be linked up with his brother in San Francisco, this completely destroys that narrative proud of him happy for him got paid young brother got paid that's right huge deal we'll get into more of the contract and the actual deal next episode little teaser for you uh last thing on that i saw something funny on social media somewhere someone saying what you alluded to people were in san francisco hoping for bosa to join his brother nick now there's people in la saying well maybe when nick's contract expires he can join his brother in la now so never know maybe that'll be the next talk they they put the pressure on the teams man they did it (laughs) For real. So great contract there. But uh, let's go ahead and get into this awesome interview. Had so much fun once again with uh, Doc and Isaac. So without further ado, here is that interview. All right, everyone. Well, as we mentioned in the intro, super excited about the guests that Frosty and I are welcoming on today to the LA Football Podcast. Played together at Memphis, had a stint together at the Rams. We're talking to Doc Holliday and now Hall of Fame wide receiver Isaac Bruce. Gentlemen, what's going on? Oh, not too much, man. Uh, happy to be on board. Uh, looking forward to football this season, uh, college and pro. But um, just quarantining and uh, staying with the family, man, making sure everybody's healthy. Glad to be with you all today, man. Thanks for the invite, man. Looking forward to the conversation. Absolutely, yeah. And if you guys didn't know, Doc and Isaac are on the Believe Podcast Network as well. So you can find them. Uh, L.A. Ramblings is the name of that uh, the podcast, right? Yeah, exactly. Ramblings. Believe in Rams, man. Ramblings with the Pro Football <laughs> Hall of Famer, the Golden Child. Isaac Bruce, uh, man. The there we Holiday, go. Man. <laughs> Doc's the hype man, I take it. I think it I take it Doc's the hype man. Always, man. It's my hey, this my hey, this my guy, man. It's always been me, man, from day one, man. I love it. Well, let let me ask before we get into uh, you know, we're gonna talk to you guys about some college days and stuff. Before we get into that, what's it been like, uh, Doc? I'll, I'll ask you first, just getting into the podcasting game because I know it's a different Obviously, what you guys did playing football, but now you're, you're doing a podcast. How's, how's that relationship and, and just doing this going for you? Oh, it's fun, man. I, again, I actually started a podcast two years ago, man. Uh, okay. uh, Run Pass Option Podcast. So we had that going on, man. And we're actually going to get it started again this year, you know. And, uh, and then we weighed this opportunity, came up, man. So we kind of, you know, we kind of on this platform right now. So, I mean, it's fun, man. Me and Isaac, man, been knowing each other almost 30 years, man, like, like a brother to me, man. That's so awesome. uh, it's just good, man. It's just good uh, being able to talk football and talk life with them. Well, absolutely. That's the best part of it. I know me and Frosty love doing that. We talk life all the time, right? Right. I'm fairly new to this game, too. And so t- sometimes I have to watch what I say. But it seems like you guys got that, uh, that brotherhood going that you can uh, get on one another all the time. So that's always easy going. Well, I'll tell you what, man, I, I don't think Doc and I have ever had to watch what we say around each other. So <laughs> this, gives, this gives us another, you know, platform to really just kind of speak from the heart and, uh, you know, talk about, you know, relevant subjects that, that, that's happening. So been doing that for a very long time. And, and like I mentioned to Doc when we started, I'm a homer. So this, this is really easy for me. So um, and I don't like people talking down on my team at all. all right. So I think they got the right two people, you know, leading the charge from that standpoint. That's good. Yeah, you got to put you got to put them in their place. So um, that's good. Well, well, cool guys. Well, we're excited for this. So I'll, I'll just get off and rolling. Um, you know, you guys both. You know, I, you know, Isaac. I know you went had kind of a different path how you got to Memphis. So I'll just start with you. 
you know, talk about your journey from, you know, growing up in Florida and then all of a sudden, you know, jumping over to uh, at Memphis. I know there's a little bit of a different carry on there, but uh, talk about your journey a little bit. My journey, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm born and raised in South Florida and uh, where football is always king, especially high school football. And uh, I kind of walked right into that path, just following the lead of uh, uh, older brothers, uh, uh, older guys in the neighborhood. I always just grew up going to practices and watching these guys perform and just really just waited my turn. And from there, once I graduated uh, high school, uh, I got a scholarship offer to go to Purdue, but it, that didn't work out academically. And from that standpoint, I got an invite <clears throat> to head out, head out west to Los Angeles. I started at West Los Angeles College and from there transferred to Santa Monica City College for a year where I played football the two years and uh, was recruited by Randy Feetner, the current offensive coordinator uh, for the Pittsburgh Steelers to Memphis. Wow. And I uh, felt like when I got to Memphis, man, I was, you know, I felt like I was at home. Uh, they played a, played a great brand of football. And what I mean by that is that, you know, they were a bunch of guys like myself that didn't go to the hometown team, the powerhouses, Florida's, the Miami's, the Florida States, but guys who could play and had a, had a desire to be great. And when I looked at Memphis's schedule, uh, they had Alabama, USC, Tennessee, uh, Arkansas. They played teams like that. So I figured if I couldn't play for those teams or in the SEC, uh, just playing against those guys would give me uh, an opportunity to really to not, not only develop myself as a player, but show my skills on a, on a level where in which I wanted to play. Isaac, this is Frosty. So you're saying the Florida schools and SEC schools did not offer you scholarships? That's exactly what I'm saying. I think <laughs> the only postcard I got was from a Steve Spurrier, and it was right when I enrolled in junior college, and I got a, uh, a letter, a uh, postcard from them, uh, th with them saying they're watching me. So, you know, that's the closest I got to the big three. Um, right. Uh, fortunately, got an opportunity to play in college against the University of Miami. Had a good time doing that. But uh, that was about it, man. I mean, uh, I wasn't I was heartbroken, but then I wasn't heartbroken. But uh, I had an opportunity, and I use it as fuel whenever I face those guys on the next level, on that ultimate level. I use that as fuel because I felt like that guy got my scholarship. So right. I'm gonna give you I'm gonna give you eight catches, 150 yards, and two touchdowns. Yeah, every time. You remember stats, I, I, I mean, you, you remember stats against Miami. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It means something to him, huh? Why Absolutely. Not? As you should. Uh, Doc, you were, what, born, born and raised in Memphis, right? No doubt, man. Born and so, raised, man. So was yeah. it always Memphis or bust, or was there another option for you? The running back over here. Well, you know what, man? Actually, I, I grew up a huge Memphis State. Uh, it was Memphis State at the time. I grew right. up a huge Memphis State basketball fan, so I really didn't know it much about Memphis State football, but I grew up such a huge Memphis State basketball fan, man. I wanted to be a part of that program, man. So when they was recruiting me, man, it was up. It was between, you know, Memphis State, Ole Miss, Arkansas, Northern Illinois, uh, Arkansas State, and uh, Tennessee kind of came in late, man. But after that, you know, uh, once I went on my recruiting trip to Memphis, I didn't even know what Memphis State's campus was, and I'm born and raised in Memphis, man. I right around the corner. It. Yeah, man, I, but I just kind of just stayed in the hood, man, you know, in my hood and didn't go around. But when I went, man, I had such a good time, man. Uh, yeah, it was a no-brainer for me to uh, stay here at home and play for the Tigers. Hey, Doc, what high school did you go to? What neighborhood did you grow up in? Fairly High School, man. They call it they, – it's in the community of Whitehaven, but since Whitehaven is a I'm white Haven. school – we don't really like to call it White Haven. It's Black Haven. South Fair. Yeah, Black Haven, that's exactly what we call it, man. But you, you know a little something. Hey, man, you might I be do. Call, your family might be even call you, but you know a little something about Memphis. Yeah, I've been around. I've been on the expressway. <laughs> I know what he was out there. The loop. Yeah, the loop. Yeah. The 64. <laughs> uh, nah, I hear you. Yeah, you know a little something, Frost. A little bit, a little bit. But that's interesting. I kind of have a, a similar story as you, Isaac. I actually went to Colorado State first and transferred back home to USC and found my success there. But, um, yeah, it's, it was nothing about going against those teams that, you know, you got the mail and you got those letterheads in the mail, you read them, you think, you know, you got a shot and then they don't call you. I had an opportunity transferring to go to USC and get busy there. So uh, kind of reversed. Man, y'all gotta ask, ask Isaac about his his uh, his uh, his black t-shirts all them Florida guys wore when we played down in the Orange Bowl. Man, they didn't even you know they, they played for Memphis State, but they were Florida guys back in Miami. Man, I tell them about it, about them them black t-shirts. Man, you, you and them you and them <laughs> Florida guys had on man playing in the Orange Bowl. Man, it was like, hold on, man, what y'all got on, man? <laughs> 
Oh, absolutely, man. You know, that, it was kind of a tradition, uh, you know, just growing up in the 80s and the 90s, being a Hurricane fan. And uh, you see all the Hurricane greats, man. They, they had the orange, the white pants, but underneath they'd always had this black T-shirt on. And, uh, you know, that's kind of what we wanted to emulate when we played uh, down in Miami. So, but a buddy of mine, uh, John Tweet Martin, Tweet. So I kind of, we kind of went out to the Walmart, got us some black t-shirts and, and uh, made, made, the, <laughs> made the Memphis boys on the team a little bit jealous because they really didn't know what was going on that day. But uh, it, was, it, was all, it was all good. It was all uh, in fun. And, uh, you know, what's funny is uh, you, mentioned, you mentioned Colorado State. It came down between Colorado State and Memphis State for me. At okay. that time, Earl Bruce was the head coach, and I was being recruited by Urban Meyer uh, to go wow. to Colorado State at that time. So. It's kind of funny you said that, man. So yeah, I remember those days. Oh yeah, yeah I always forget. I always forget Urban Meyer got his start in you know the Mountain West. He was back with Utah when they were still in the Mountain West, and obviously the rest is history with him. But so how did how did you two, Doc? I'll ask you. How did you two guys? Uh, obviously, you both played offense. You played running back. Isaac playing receiver. Did you guys hit it off right away, or how did you create this brotherhood that you've talked about? Oh man, you know Isaac got to Memphis, man. He didn't really hit it off with anybody, man, because he kind of he was quiet. He kind of stayed to himself, and he was so Florida serious. Boy. Yeah, you know, what I'm saying? now you know, in the Florida, but them Florida guys, they do a lot of yapping. But he didn't do a lot of yapping, <laughs> so he showed up, man. You know, I'm like, uh, you know, I still remember. The, I think one of the first things I said sometimes, I was like, "What's up, Cuz?" And he he looked, he like, "I ain't Cuz, I'm blood." He was lying. So we looked at. I kind of stood back. I said, "Okay, this dude here want to play games and stuff, man." But seriously, man, he you know he was quiet. He didn't say much, man. And when we first you know got out on the field and the first time we saw him run routes, it was seriously, I was like, oh, damn. Man, you can't guard that dude, man. You don't even know when he, you know, you don't even know when he's going to cut. So I, I just kind of, you know, he and I kind of hit it off back. You know, then, man, I would mess with him. And finally, man, you know, he he he, he broke down. Then by him, me, me and him spending so much time together, man, on the field and in offensive meetings, man, and actually in the dorm, you know, we stayed on the same hall in the same wing. I used to be down in his room a lot. He used to be down in my room a lot, man. Right. So, you know, uh, just just the brotherhood that that uh, uh, that grew from there. So, did you get a, t a chance to take him home, get some of that Memphis cooking? Oh, come on, man, Isaac! How many times you been in my house, man? My aunt's house, Big Mama. Come on, man, he was all in the hood, man. He from he I might, think two, he, he I think two Farrell, times. Huh? <laughs> man, quit! Like, come on, bro. <laughs> no, you, no, you you just seen my wife two times. That's it. You just seen my wife just twice, but. <laughs> Going to the house, man, quite often, man. He was always, you know, we, we was always coming around doing some things. Yeah, that's what's up, man. That's what's up. Yeah, love it. So, you know, and then Isaac, you get drafted in the, the second round by the Rams. Uh, Doc, did you did you follow him there? Or what was your your journey getting over to uh, St. Louis? Man, it was, uh, you know, my, my, my senior year, I only really played in six games. So I was hurt. I got hurt in training camp. And then when I played, man, uh, I, I ran off a string of 100-yard games and I tore my hamstring. So and I played in the blue-gray game and got hurt again. So I really didn't. And I had teams coming in wanting to work me out, but I really couldn't work out because I, my hamstring was still torn. Right. But I did let a couple of teams, the Eagles were one, trick me into running the 40. And you know what? Come on, man. Once you get a, a time, whether you hurt or not, they don't give a damn. They just looking no. at the time. It's you just know like what I mean? the film. Just like the film, man. So uh, I actually set out, but while I set out, uh, you know, they were in L.A. And then when they moved to uh, moved to St. Louis, of course, I was going to, you know, visit Isaac a couple of times, man. I'm like, man, you know, that's my brother, man. And I'm looking at the, I'm looking at the team. So actually what I was doing, I was, uh, you know, I was kind of reaching out and sending emails to St. Louis and other teams like once a month. Like, don't forget about me. And they never said anything. They never said anything until – that spring of uh, 96, they brought me in to work out with uh, me and Alonzo Highsmith. Uh, both of us were working out for a, a position, and they ended up bringing me to camp, man. And uh, nice. you know, once I got, yeah, once I got to camp, I, you know, I, you know, I, it, it was, yeah, I, I got busy, man. But they still, they had drafted four, uh, four rookie running backs that year, so it was tough Jeez. on me. But you know, my, my, my guy Ike, man, he always kept me uplifted, man, and. It, they knew I was balling, man. So, you know, I started on the practice squad. Then, they, you know, once they activated me, I was happy as heck, man. So that's that's how – and it, it didn't it didn't hurt me that, you know, the star of the team was was like my brother. You know, he didn't really – you know, he didn't really say too much, but he did. You know, he, he, would, say, he would say nice things about me when we in film room. Like, you know, good play, Doc. You know, Mike Marsh wasn't saying nothing, the offensive coordinator. Right. That's when I knew right. they were going to cut me, though. I knew they were going to cut me. They weren't saying anything. But my boy was – uh, you know, he, he was pumping me up. So Not a, not a bad advocate to have. 
No, no yeah, doubt about no, it. Yeah, that practice squad, man, you got to be a different beast to, to go out there and stay motivated, stay healthy, um, not travel, but just stay connected with the team. You know, uh, a lot of people don't understand, you know, being locker room, how much you guys' value and worth is. So, you know, it's good to hear that your, your spirits are high and your, your guy was right there uh, cheering you on. No doubt about it, man. Then it was about, what, four or 5,000 a week. So I wasn't going to be crying about that, man. I wasn't working with two or three. You know what I'm saying? I'm straight. Yeah, a couple hours and I get to go. A couple to the hours. Crib. That's it. There you go. So were you staying with Isaac better or you were on your own? Wait, say Frost. Were you staying with Isaac or were you on your own? Come on, bro. Big, big bank take care of little bank, man. Isaac yeah, got, no. what you had, a one bedroom, Mike? Oh, I slept in the den, brother. <laughs> I slept in the den. <laughs> yes, sir. I love Water it. for downs. I love it. I love it. Well, and obviously, probably not great for your uh, obviously playing a bill or your tenure there. You know, the Rams had one of the greatest ever in Marshall Falk. So, you know, Isaac, I'm curious. You're on this arguably the greatest offensive team, but probably one of the most well known just teams in NFL history, the greatest show on turf. Um, so, obviously, I have to ask about it. You know, what was it like? playing for just such a revolutionary offense during that time and you guys kind of revolutionized the game with you know Mike Mark's fun offensive system playing with you know Kurt Warner's story you have Marshall Falk you have yourself you have Torrey Holt all these awesome awesome guys what was it just like playing for that team and then being in the locker room with all those guys well to be honest I think that those group of guys uh we made uh the name I don't think the name made us mm -hmm. uh from a standpoint of uh you had so much talent on one offense, uh, and you know, a lot of times the guys that aren't mentioned, guys like Ricky Pro and guys like Aza Kim, they they're they're rarely mentioned, but they played such an integral part in what we were putting in the product that we were putting on the field. Um, you know, it was fun because you had so much talent and guys who were like selfless. Right? I mean, we were we were willing and 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 able to do whatever we had to do to win. Uh, you know, what I mean by that is if you know, if I had to be uh, the uh, main guy that week or if I had to be the decoy that week, you know, I always did it to the best of my ability. And just about every guy that you named, they, they were willing to do the same thing. So we never had guys who were selfish, uh, guys who didn't want to run clear out routes, guys who didn't want to block. Uh, if it was a turnover, we, everybody wanted to tackle and wanted to be that guy. And just to have a mesh of guys like that, man, it was, it was, it was just awesome because uh, I can see the fingerprint of the greatest show on turf on just about every team right now in the NFL. And I think a lot of teams and just about every team has tried to emulate that um, from a standpoint of personnel and being able to run the things that we ran. Um, they get close, but I don't think one team has emulated it from a personnel standpoint because I mean, you're talking, you know, guys who have already been enshrined, maybe three guys, probably two more from that team. Uh, well, two more definitely uh, from that team that's going to be end up being enshrined. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a great mesh, great mesh of guys, uh, great personalities, guys who worked hard. Uh, and those things were at the very for forefront, just the work ethic behind what we did. And, and when we got on the, planet, on the planet field on Sundays and Monday nights, man, uh, we just let our hair down. Yeah, the, the word you said, selfless, sticks out to me because that's how I try to play the ball and be the ultimate teammate like that. And I think that is what brings the success. Um, was it Coach March that really drove you guys or was it the athletes? Or did you guys have a, a particular coach that was the one that was grinding you guys and getting you guys running to the ball and doing all the little things? It was about a mixture of both. I mean, um, what Coach March brought was just a confidence, an air of confidence that was infectious towards everybody. The, I mean, uh, the coaches that I respect were the guys who would say one thing in the locker room, and then at the media press conference, they'd say the exact same thing. So they always mm -hmm. gathered my respect from that standpoint, and he was one of them. Uh, guys like Coach Al Saunders, he was my position coach that year. You know, he was always about uh, uh, helping each other, helping this guy. Um, if the ball's going the opposite way, you convoy, you do everything you can to get in the film, and possibly make a block and help spring your guy. So we had that right. mentality. And when the, I felt like when uh, that mindset hit, hit the, the leaders of the team, hit, when it hit the Orlando Paces, when it hit right. the Marshall Fox, and when guys saw them doing it, they just fell right in line. So it made it a whole lot easier once you got the best players on your team uh, to fall in line and, and be willing to make plays without the ball in their hands. So 
that was infectious from a standpoint that everybody just followed it, man. And it always pays off for you. And it paid off for us in the form of a championship. Yeah. You know, as, as a fan, I'm always curious. And first of all, I, such an honor for me to be talking to three former NFL players, college players. It's so cool that I, I get to do this. So thank you. But as a fan, I'm always curious when there's a transition from a head coach and then an OC or a DC becomes a head coach, obviously a guy that's been in the locker room. You mentioned March was there pretty much since you got there, but you had Dick Vermeil and then he retires and Mike March comes in as the new head coach. What's that transition like? Is he still kind of the locker room feel the same? Is it a, is it a different kind of a, a you know, struggle with power or what, did it feel pretty fluid? Well, um, most of those guys, they're, they're graduating from a leadership standpoint. I mean, offensive coordinator, he leads the entire offense. Defense coordinator, he leads the defense. And when one of those guys are promoted, um, it, there isn't much difference. But, you know, the, most definitely they want to put their imprint on the team. And uh, some guys are different. But it, to me, it's always been up to the player. Because if, if you're playing football, you got to expect change to happen. I mean, it's very rare that you play for one coach your entire career if you play over five seasons. So uh, your coordinator may change, your head coach may change, but it's always been up to the player, I felt, to have uh, an air of being a professional. I mean, y your job is to, number one, be prepared to play. Number two, to go in learn what you have to learn as far as offensive play and defensive play, and then go out and execute. So just, just having that mindset, I think it bodes well for a lot of people. So when, when the change happens, it really doesn't blow you out of the water, you know, but you can just ride the wave. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm curious too, um, and th this will go to that, the Super Bowl there. And, and Doc, you can, you can maybe jump in on this too, but I'll ask Isaac first. When you're watching that last drive against the Tennessee Titans, you guys have the lead, uh, what is it, six-point lead, 23 or seven-point lead, and, you know, Tennessee starts driving down. Uh, and that, that last play, the infamous play, maybe the most infamous play in Super Bowl history, or at least top yeah. five probably. What's going through your mind as someone on offense, someone on the sideline, someone that has no control over the situation? How are you watching? Are you turning your back? Are you, are you trying to stay focused? What's really going through your mind just watching that unfold? Uh, and then obviously it ends in your favor and you become Super Bowl champions. Oh, most definitely. I'm watching, man. I mean, I'm a football fan uh, first and foremost. But, um, you know, my first thought is, okay, I think we left too much time on the clock. Uh, you know, there's one minute, 54 seconds left, and we're playing, playing against the great Steve McNair. And I've seen him done heroic things throughout his college career and, and even, you know, his, his MVP seasons uh, on the professional league. But uh, just watching that game and just being, uh, uh, you know, uh, really a spectator at that moment because, you know, I didn't play defense. I couldn't play defense. And uh, I felt like our defense trusted us the entire season. And there were moments in that season where we had to trust our defensive players and, and defensive coaches to either get us the ball back or get us another opportunity to score. And this was nothing different, man. I mean, it, it, just, just being there and just really cheering on the guys, making sure that, you know, every tackle was made, every opportunity was uh, taken advantage of. But uh, it was one of those iconic moments that I don't think will ever dissipate out of anyone's mind, man, because just having uh, the play – in the game and the Super Bowl championship in, in the, in the manner in which it did. I don't, I, don't, I haven't seen anything that matched that from the season itself, the stories that came with the Rams, the stories that were with the Titans at that time and just have, have it all culminate and just end the way it ended, man. I think it's one of those icon, iconic Super Bowl moments that will live forever. Oh, it's poetic for sure. Doc, were you, where were you watching the game? Were you at the stadium or were you at a bar somewhere? No, man. No, oh, man. I was, I was chicken back wings. There. No, man, I was back here in Memphis working, man. I was working at, uh, uh, cause I've been in TV, man, since, uh, I got back to Memphis. So I was actually working at, um, uh, channel five here, uh, NBC affiliate, man. And we were watching it. And, you know, before, you know, we go to that Mike Jones play, man, hell before then, man, when the game was tied, when, when we got the ball, I, I, I stood up, I said, my boy finna strike him right now. That's exactly what I said at work. And what happened? My guy hit him with the 73 hitter, the underthrown there. Kurt Warner pass. Kurt getting all the credit, but my boy's the one who wouldn't got it and got gone. So once he scored, yep. I was still riding the high on that. But then when I'm watching that last drive and I'm looking at Steve McNair and I'm like, hold on, bro. Y'all got to get, man, get big dude down. And I'm seeing Kevin Carter tired. I'm seeing the defense tired. I'm like, oh my gosh, man. This game is finna go into overtime, but 
when that tackle was made, man, hey, man, what can I say, man? My brother's a Super Bowl champion. Yeah, it is close, but he's the champion. And, you know, had it, been, uh-huh. had it not been for that Mike Jones tackle, man, we, we, everybody will be talking about my guy's 73-yarder. But since <laughs> the Mike Jones made the dramatic tackle, that's what everybody remembers. But I remember that 73-yarder. So I was just happy, man, to see my guy, man, uh, be a Super Bowl champion. But, yeah, I was back home in Memphis working, man. I had – I had bills to pay, man. You know, I can't, uh, you know, I, I, I rich, man, but he ain't finna be buying no hotels and for me to come to the Super Bowl when we be kicking it while he working. Right. You know, I had a family to take care of, man. But now nah, I'm hey, so proud of him, man, and just so happy, man. Hey, Isaac, how long did you guys party after that Super Bowl win? Oh, man, it's funny, man. Um, <laughs> after the game, you know, they have this huge hotel ballroom in our hotel. So we go back, everybody's there. I mean, from family to friends, to, to friends, friends, and everybody, celebrities, right. and uh, big DJ. I mean, as you can imagine, alcohol is everywhere. Mm-hmm. And um, it was a very long party, man. Uh, slept right through the, the team parade the following day after we landed back in St. Louis. And woke up and I saw, you know, uh, it was on TV. The, the television, my television was on. I see uh, the, the train of, uh, floats going downtown with Tory Hope standing on one of the floats dancing and I'm rubbing my eyes I'm like yo man the, the, the parade's going on I'm still here in bed so I missed out on that but it was great man I mean it was a, it was a long party that that kind of went right into uh the start of the all-season program for us yeah that's good man ultimate success all I've gotten to the NFC championship game got blown out by the Carolina Panthers when I played for uh yeah Cam Newton got blown out by them so I didn't get to that part and that Super Bowl, and I wish I did. I got 13 years in. I wanted more just to get that get that feeling of that trophy and whatnot. I didn't get there, but we're big fans, and I'm glad you did. Absolutely, man. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, what a what a great moment and for the team. And you know, after that season culminated, and you kind of go and you still have really good success on offense. Then just things didn't quite work out. Obviously, you had the loss to the Patriots. But uh, what was it you think that? transition the team from that eye to all of a sudden then kind of you know the players break out obviously we saw Kurt Warner get cut he ends up signing with the Giants was there a is just kind of the, the team had run at course or I'm always curious how those great dynasties kind of come to an end I don't know if you can even finger point on anything but well to be honest everything starts with the hit man I mean as a man thinks so is he uh, you know when when there's when there's a bit of a turmoil upstairs and in, uh, in the executive offices and the, from mm-hmm. the general manager standpoint from ownership standpoint, uh, when there's whenever there's a, there's a flux, I think the product that that you know you put on the field will suffer, and uh, yeah. the Rams were no different from that. Uh, we had some moments where a lot of people were not agreeing with each other, and you know we just kind of paused as far as building a team uh, or putting together a product that can be competitive the way you know we had been competitive th- those couple of years. So um, I think it was some moments missed. Uh, so there was there was a lot of business decisions mixed into that, uh, which ultimately got the team back in L.A. Mm. Yeah, well, it's, that, that's a great segue. I was going to ask, uh, Doc, I'll start with you. Were you guys bummed when they moved back to L.A.? Were you cool with it? I mean, obviously, you guys had connection with guys in St. Louis and, and fans and stuff there, but were you – happy they were back in LA or what were your, what were your feelings on that? Uh, man, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't care less, man. It was cool, man. You know, I played, it was the St. Louis Ram, but Isaac, the LA Rams drafted him. So for yeah. them to go back to LA, you know, I'm just a huge Rams fan, man. And I love the city of LA. So, uh, you know, I was happy to see that, uh, uh, that return back to LA, man. Sad for the people in St. Louis. Like I said, cause I had fun in St. Louis, St. Louis, some great fans, but LA, some great fans as well, man. So to see them embrace the Rams like that, and to see, you know, uh, that organization go back, really go back to his roots. So uh, uh, I was glad that they made the transition, man. And I'm looking forward uh, to them doing more great things in L.A. And especially with, you know, with this new stadium open up. So looking forward to all of that, man. So, I'm, you know, I'm glad that the Rams are back in L.A., man. But, you know, we still love the fans in St. Louis as well. Hey, Doc, I got a question for you. Yeah, yeah. Since you went to uh, St. Louis and you had a little bit more time than Isaac did to go check out restaurants and whatnot, is it the Memphis barbecue better or is it St. Louis barbecue? Come on, bro. It's not even close, man. That's Memphis barbecue, man. Dry, wet, doesn't matter, man. It's not, I mean, come on, man. It's not It's not even close. I had to ask, man. Yeah, I, I appreciate you, man. I'm, man. I'm frosty. I, I appreciate you, man. Even even our frosties are better than St. Louis frosties. You know what I'm saying? So everything I appreciate about it. it. Everything about it, man. I ain't no doubt about it. I'm a homer, man. I love my city, man. 
Have you have you had have you had like KC barbecue and Texas barbecue also? Yeah, I've been to Texas. I've been to KC. Of course, you know, of course, man. I've had it, man. It's, it's Memphis barbecue all the way. If you haven't been, if you haven't had Memphis barbecue, I don't really don't know what to tell you. Oh, no, no, I, I don't know what to tell you. What's your favorite spot out there? In, in... Big Bill's barbecue, man. Big okay, Bill's sure, barbecue. Big Bills. They got one in the Haven. They just opened up one in East Memphis, man. A childhood friend of mine owns it. Uh, oh. uh, yeah, man. Big Bill's barbecue, man. So we throw your name. We getting free ribs and. <laughs> Are they gonna hook you up? Yeah, they gonna, I, okay. I don't know. It's, you, hey, because uh, I, you know, uh, uh, that's Woot who owns Big Bills. You know, Woot kind of tight with that money, man. He might give you a free yeah. coat, but he wants that. Loot. <laughs> he want he want that loot for that money, though. But well, nah, they'll yeah, hook you up, yeah. man. They're some great people. That's good. Nah, definitely a great barbecue in Memphis, but I won't say it's not even close. It's some good barbecue in Missouri, but uh, yeah, I've had. I definitely had Memphis. I put Memphis just slightly ahead of St. Louis. Yeah, you gotta always go with the hometown. You gotta go with the hometown. But I've had it all. It's all good to me. So I, it's hard to for me being a simpleton, hard to tell all the all the intricacies of all the great barbecue. So to me, it all just tastes great. Hey fellas, let me clear this up right quick because Isaac's not gonna say. Hey, check it out now. He doesn't drink. So when he when he slept through the parade, trust me, he wasn't drunk. He might have been fully he might have been fully hydrated with water, but he was not drunk because he don't drink now. You know what I'm saying? He might have been over H too old, but. Hey, I just want to clear that up. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Barbecue out. That's exactly what I was thinking. So. Yeah. No, no, no. I get No, 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 no. <laughs> hey, Ike, I got a question for you. Sorry, I'm calling you Ike. He just keeps saying it. So, you know. Yeah, my bad. Yeah, Isaac. I'm no, no. sorry. Isaac. Hey, it's, Isaac. hey. No, no. He'll get on me, man. Isaac, man. You know my name. As long as you don't get mad, you know. <laughs> but, Isaac, I got a question for you. Watching uh, Coach McVay's offense versus the offense you ran in uh, St. Louis uh, under Mike Marks. How do you uh, – do you think the offense is better? Do you see some similarities in it? And how do you feel the guys operate in that offense? Um, it's, it's similar in, in a way, and, and it's different in another way. I think what Coach McVay has, uh, you know, what a lot of people don't realize is a power running offense. Um, it, it features that run. It needs that running game uh, to be more successful than it isn't. Um, uh, as far as pre-snap, he does a lot of things that we did similar um, as far as uh, motioning, uh, going across the, you know, the formation, uh, keep guys moving so we can really dictate what the defense does. Defense. Uh, yeah. At the same time, when, when we were doing our pre-snap stuff, it was more, more to pass the ball and to open up the running game. And uh, once we got you backed off, you know, you start showing that two-man shell, you know, we just handed the ball off to 28. I mean, we, yeah. we had that advantage right there. Uh, as far as the numbers game and uh, but I think you know guys Robert Woods uh, Cooper Cup they really perform well in what uh, coach McVay you know brings to the table I mean he gets that that safety down in the box and kind of let these guys loose so I love everything about coach McVay I mean just being a receiver and I see this at Doc quite often man I'm not naive to the benefits of a running game we all need right. need that strong running game uh, to take you deep into a season, uh, take you deep into your division and possibly a playoff run. Because there's going to be a point in time where you always have to have that four-minute offense to really close out games. And if you can just line up and 907 somebody and run somebody over, that bodes well for everybody. Love it. Yeah. You know, I'm piggybacking off that, looking at the rule changes, how defenses have had to play, whatever you want to call it, softer or, you know, get, they've changed the rules to kind of benefit the offense. Do you think your offense back in the late 90s, early 2000s would be even that much more dominant in today's NFL? Uh, just to be honest, because, uh, you know, you'll get your Kansas City Chief fans <laughs> who really think that we, I, you know, people like me, people like my former teammates may be hating on them mm -hmm. uh, as far as, you know, man for man, as far as personnel is concerned. But, you know, many times I'm scream screaming from the top of the roof is that, you know, we, we played in a totally different dispensation that they're playing in. Mm -hmm. I mean, just to be honest, it's, it's almost two-hand touch to the right. uh, trained eye. I mean, you, you, number one, you can't hit the quarterback. Uh, you can't hit the receiver. Mm -hmm. So we had the mindset of, you know, if we keep going across this middle, we have to respect the game. Because if I'm going across this middle and, you know, this safety, this running lot, he doesn't have an opportunity to take my head off. Uh, you know, I, I'd better be quiet. I mean, when we were playing, you know, we didn't yap too much because these guys had the opportunity, you know, either catch the ball or not catch the ball. They're, they're starting with a headshot. So yeah, uh, from that standpoint, we respected it. 
Uh, there was a lot more uh, hands-on when we played as far as grabbing and holding. But right now, man, it's different, man. So I, I, I wouldn't say that we would double the numbers that we, that we produced. Uh, we probably triple them. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I don't mean this with any disrespect. <laughs> I see you, Doc. Max, he's speaking facts. Oh, yeah. Uh, Hundred percent. He he would know. So yes, sir. I think so. I think he's credible. And I don't mean with this this with any disrespect, but I'd love to see like a Tyreek Hill going over the middle with Steve Atwater just waiting for him. Hey, absolutely. Be a little different. Be a little different than what he does now, and he just doesn't get touched going anywhere. Well, you, yeah. you know, it's kind of like a boxer. When two guys are boxing, one may be faster, quicker than the other. You know, this this the guy who's not as fast. He'll start off hitting the guy in the hips, hitting him in his arms, try to slow this guy down. And that, that was the, you know, the plan for a lot of teams when we played. They wanted to be physical with us on the outside, uh, make sure they had their shell over the top, and really just not give us a free run down the field. So if, if you can't, if you don't have a way to slow these guys down, man, you're going to see astronomical numbers. And, you know, in my head, I'm thinking asterisk, right. but at the same time, you know, stay la vie, man. Go ahead and have it. <laughs> but that's what this league's turned into. It, it became completely offensive, you know, being the yep. defender and – I actually went to one of the meetings at the um, the combine and the rules and whatnot, and hearing from a collective a group of guys talking about, you know, your coach is telling you don't let them catch the ball, but your pocket's telling you you better let them catch it than try to wrap them up. You know, that's right. It's so hard to be a defender, and especially in the back end, like you said, going across the middle. There's no fear, and I don't, I don't, I don't particularly like the game now just because of that. And I was played this last decade in it. I, I feel like the, the years before this new CBA and these new rules that keep coming out, um, I liked it more. I like it was more physical. You could hit the quarterback yeah. and drop, drag, drag him to the ground. Now you can't even get near him and a quarterback might spin at it, you know, your tackle just because you don't want to get a fine because right. it's your money too. You know, it's not just the 15 yards, it's your money. Absolutely. Yeah. Hey, don't oh, breathe. Yeah. Don't breathe on Tom Brady. Don't breathe on him. Oh no. Don't get nowhere near his face mask. Nothing. Just grazing it. Yeah. You know, good. Yeah. Good night. Jeez. So yeah. well, let's talk a little bit about the, the current Rams before I let you guys go again, talking to doc holiday and Isaac Bruce, super excited to have you guys on uh, doc, this current Rams team. All right. For both of y'all start with you though, doc, how hard is it to go into a season? Obviously we don't need to touch on COVID. It's probably been talked about at nauseum. I'm sure you guys have touched on it too. Me and Frost, you're kind of sick and talking it, but really quickly, how tough is it going into a professional season with zero off-season program other than all virtual? Oh, it's hard as hell, man. Isaac and I just talked about that because uh, we recorded our podcast earlier today, man. And that's actually, you know, one of the topics on this week's uh, uh, show, man. It's no off-season program. Everything is virtual, man. Uh, you know, uh, because the conditioning is different, man. I mean, you're at home, you're doing your little running, but to get out there with the players and and what I'm interested to see is, not only what shape these guys come in, but when these rookies and these first-year players, this will be your first time seeing that NFL speed. And trust me, it's totally yeah. different now. You get you, you really get a chance. Man, that tempo is something else. You get a chance to see it in mini camps and all them little things, but they didn't have that. So now they, they're not going to have it in preseason games. So you're getting out there, man. It's, it's hard as hell, man. I mean, it's going to be extremely difficult, man. But, you know, they're going to have that week of uh, strength and conditioning, and I'm pretty sure they're going to run some cats in the ground on that. But uh, I can't imagine, man, going, man, them dudes hadn't seen each other. They hadn't seen this speed. They hadn't seen the size of these dudes, and they haven't seen the professionalism and the aggression and the anger of these dudes. And they're seeing it for the first time. Oh, man, these rookies and first-time players, man, yeah, they're they, they going to get their ass awakened real quick. Yeah, real I quick. think the rookies are screwed, man. Just the simple fact of what you talked about, we're talking about tempo. We're talking about when the veterans say, hey, man, chill out. And, you know, they know the tempo, but the rookies don't because they haven't felt that power. They ain't got grabbed and drugged to the ground, and the technique is different. Uh, I don't know how they're going to catch up and with this condensed time to be able to play. I don't know how they reenact this because you're going to do more walkthroughs just because, you know, mentally going over plays and whatnot. But physically, you're going to put these pads on, and it's going to be game over. I guess who playing out? The vets are saying chill out to the rookies and the first year players, and, and guess what them dudes trying to do? Make the team. So you want right. me to chill out, and you want me to get crushed? I'm gonna get cut. Your money is good. Your spot on the squad is good. But come on, bro, we're gonna fight. We that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna fight because I ain't chilling out. I, I gotta eat, man. Right. And just think about what the preseason games are lack of. You know, how do they have an opportunity to actually fight for a, a spot on the roster? Because you need the live bullets. 
this this season's so up in the air, and you know I think it's good to be a veteran right now because your chances of making the team if you stay healthy are very high. Yeah, no doubt. Oh yeah, and I even just remember you know doing off season stuff when I played, and you know you're trying to condition and doing the workout programs, but once you get even just the shells on, it just changes everything, you know, completely. So just getting those pads on, and and then you're it's almost like your workout regimen, your conditioning changes altogether and, you know, have the heat and everything. So, um, but looking at just, yeah. the, go ahead, Frost. I just think the competition at camp is going to be so high because there's not any yes. distractions. There's not going to be a lot of fans. It's going to be glued in. Yes. So I think hard knocks is going to open up a, a lot more because it's going to be more dramatic and uh, they're going to get more intimate just because there's not a lot of distraction. Yeah. Yeah. So, so all right. Uh, those, those 14 padded practices that everybody has, I think you could really sell those this year because it's going back to an old school brand of football mm -hmm. as far as practice is concerned because these guys have to have an opportunity to make the team and coaches have to see what they have in these players. Yeah, no, absolutely. It'll be, it'll be fascinating. So uh, last couple for you guys, and we'll let you go. Thanks again so much for joining us. Um, this Rams team goes 9-7 and seven last year. Uh, couple additions in the offseason, a couple losses also. Let's obviously focus on – we can talk both, but we'll focus on offense, and you guys are both offensive guys. Sorry, Frost. Um, but yeah. What do you think this uh, offensive unit needs to really do? Isaac, I'll start with you, to get back to what we saw in 2018. Obviously, they had offensive line struggles last year. No more Todd Gurley. But if you were to pinpoint something, what's the one thing they really need to do to turn this unit around in 2020? Just, be, just reestablish the run game. Uh, just uh, be committed to it. Uh, making sure that, you know, every every game plan each week is centered around running the football. I think we drafted a really good running back from Florida State, mm -hmm. a guy who I felt like he was flying under the radar for, for you know, his entire tenure at Florida State. Uh, played really well. He, he kind of reminds me uh, of uh, Dalvin Cook a little bit, maybe a little faster with better hands mm -hmm. out of the backfield. Um, I think if we can get him in with a combination of what Henderson brings to the table, uh, and just just get some movement on that offensive line and just mm -hmm. be committed to that run. I think that keeps us in a lot of football games. And I think as far as your coaching standpoint and what we have at quarterback with Jared Goff, you know, I think that puts us in a position to win some games. And definitely if we can force teams within our division to get into a shootout, um, I, I think that bodes well for us. So just having that running game, being committed to it should open up a lot of stuff. Yeah. Isaac, what, what team is to be in the division right now? Um, obviously, Seattle just got a new addition at safety. Is it still the Niners? Who is it? Well, yeah, you, you're definitely going to have that, that north-south battle uh, with the 49ers and the Rams uh, going against each other. Um, I'm sure the 49ers are going to realize, you know, what the Rams realized a couple of years ago. Once you go to the Super Bowl, either win or lose, that bullseye's going to be right on your chest, mm -hmm. uh, even more so versus – uh, your division opponents uh, <clears throat> with Arizona up and coming. Uh, their yes. quarterback situation is looking better and better every day with the addition of uh, DeAndre Hopkins. Um, yeah, I, I think San Francisco is going to feel the brunt of what everything in that division is going to bring. And uh, they better be prepared, man. Right. Yeah. Doc, do we see the third year in a row with a NFC West team representing the NFC in the Super Bowl? I hope so, man. I think so, man. And I, you know, and I, I'm fully confident that you know the Rams can get back there. It's like what Isaac said, man. They got we got to run the rock, bro. It all comes down to running the rock, man. Last year, I think you know I broke the broke the numbers down. Last last year, man, when they ran when we ran the ball at least thirty times or more, seven and zero. Mm -hmm. You got you got nine wins. We were seven and zero, man. Even though the per yard average was kind of trash we didn't have not one running back average four yards of carry doesn't matter when we run the ball at least 30 times or more they were seven and zero. so that's what they need to do so uh if we can get back to that man that defense can play a whole lot better man yeah i, th I think the nfc west can uh uh have a, another representative in the super bowl man and we had to worry about them dudes in the bay hey, hey doc and isaac uh you guys touched on running the ball right establishing that run games that opens that play action pass and whatnot but do you think once you pay a quarterback he has to become the focal point of the offense and throw the ball down the field. You think they, they battled that last year or they just need to get back to the run game? Well, he has to become that. That doesn't mean that he has to, he has to be the complete focal point of the way we score points uh, right now. I mean, we have a lot of talent on the field. Uh, mm -hmm. We mentioned Akers, Robert Woods, Cooper Cup, uh, Tyler Higby. I think he's going to have a breakout season this year, along with Everett. These guys are, are like hybrid tight ends, guys 
who can uh, get down the field. They're matchup problems for guys on the defensive end. But I think eventually golf is going to have to become that guy who can win a football game, who can just uh, win a consistent shootout consistently. Um, I, I think he's becoming that guy. Is he there yet? I don't think so. But just being able to facilitate and get, guy, get the ball into the hands of the guys that's on the offensive team uh, bore well for him. Do you think, and this is the last one for me, do you think, because Goff, Goff seems to get a lot of it, hate around the league as, as far as fans go. He doesn't get a lot of credit in the media. I know that NFL 100 is kind of a farce, but didn't make the top 100. Um, do you think some of that is because the, the game is shifting to a much different style of quarterback, the mobile quarterback, Lamar Jackson, Deshaun Watson, Russell Wilson, and Goff is your prototypical pocket passer? Do you think that hurts his image, or is it just because he had kind of a down year after getting a big contract and – Players are expect players and fans are expecting him to be the focal point of the offense, as Frosty alluded to. Well, it, it may have something to do with with both of those aspects. I mean, when you when you, when you look at Lamar Jackson and these other guys, Patrick Mahomes, as far as what they can do mobily and outside of the pocket, it's pretty electrifying, man. I mean, it it it, it gets people on the edge of the seats. Uh, you have nervous defensive coordinators trying to stop these guys. You have some very fatigued defensive linemen trying to corral these guys, and um, when, when, you, when you play against a, a different style quarterback that, does, that isn't as mobile as these guys are, um, it, it, I, I, I can imagine, you know, guys would most enjoy playing against a guy like that who's going to sit in the pocket and try to pick Absolutely. you apart and instead of extending plays the way these other guys can do. So um, it, it's all about what you, what you want. You know, with, the, with the, the addition of his new contract, there's a little pressure that comes from it, but at the same time, you have to be a professional to say, you know what, I'm going to even make more money than, than this, but my goal setting won't stop. Uh, mm-hmm. My goal is to be an all pro, be a Super Bowl champion. And hopefully that's the mindset that golf is taking for the benefit of us all. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Well, absolutely. both of you guys, I'm big fans. Thank you. I'm uh, glad we're on the same network with Believe Network here. Um, hopefully we'll be doing this once the season starts and we'll be able to go back and forth and uh, join in on each other's cast. Uh, I, again, I appreciate it. Doc, you're from Memphis. My folks are from there. Shout out to you. Appreciate and, uh, you. Yeah. You, know, Doc, you guys are a great, great interviewer. <laughs> Doc, Isaac, thanks so much. We, uh, we just appreciate it. Congrats again, Isaac, on the Hall of Fame. Bummed that uh, yes. we don't have the ceremony this year, but it'll, it'll be the right time when it happens, right? Absolutely, man. It'll be fun, man. Yeah. So congrats. Much deserving, too. Absolutely. Thank you. you guys stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, we'll definitely talk soon, okay? All right. Thanks, yes, fellas. All right. Well, hope you guys enjoyed that. I know we certainly did, Frosty. So much fun talking to those two guys, uh, Doc Holliday and Isaac Bruce. Anytime you can get a Hall of Famer on, uh, it's a lot of fun. But obviously, Doc brings an amazing energy as well. So I had a blast. Yeah, man. Just stemming back from their days in Memphis, uh, going all the way to the professional football. And obviously, Isaac being a Hall of Fame player and them being real tight, just like best friends, uh, class acts. And I'm glad I had a chance to speak on it. I'm a big fan. So, again, I loved it. Yeah, I love how uh, Doc was saying when Isaac was, you know, already an instrumental part of the team, he was still sleeping in his den, not even like a, not even like a big pad that he had his own room. He was just in the den on the couch. Absolutely. Just the way he, they transitioned, you know, he went from JUCO to, to Memphis and to the big leagues, and he just kept the same mindset and just stayed focused and worked hard, wanted to be the best, and now he's a GOAT. So, class X. Yeah, pay your dues, do that. So, uh, big thanks to those guys. Check out their show, LA Ramblings, on the Believe Podcast Network. Hopefully, you enjoyed it. Let us know uh, any other players you want to hear from. We're lining up all these interviews. Uh, Frost and I are excited about the direction of the show. Um, Frost, where can everyone find you at? At The Organic Frost, and that's on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Pretty easy. Same on all of them. I am Ryan Dyrud, LAFB. Love to hear your questions, your thoughts, talk some L.A. football with you. Uh, Stay healthy, stay safe. Frost, anything you want to say before we uh, sign off? Well, you said it. Stay healthy, stay safe, and uh, get ready for some football because it's coming. That's right, baby. Whether you like it or not, training camp starts this week. Rookies are already reporting, so we'll have plenty to talk about on the next episode. Like I said, we'll get a little bit more into that Joey Bosa contract. Big news for the Chargers. But this is the L.A. Football Podcast. Have a great weekend, and we'll talk to you all soon. Wear your mask.